All right, 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. Now, I'm not going to go through the entire chapter tonight. There's a lot of things that we've already covered previously in the past couple weeks. Um, I've already preached a lot on the latter part of this chapter that has to do with... Um, eating the, the, the sacrifice that sacrificed the devils and, and people who have sacrificed things unto idols. So I'm going to spend the majority of our time tonight going through the first, the first verses of chapter 10. So let's, start, let's get started here in verse number 1. The Bible reads, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Now, this is truly amazing, and I love seeing, reading these verses. This is not the only one in the Bible that refers to Christ in reference to the Old Testament. So many people have this false belief and false understanding about the Old Testament. And they think that people in the Old Testament were saved by their works and they were saved by the law and that God gave them the law and that was how the Jews got saved and they had to keep the law in order to be saved. But that's just not true because God did give the law, yes. He did give the law to the children of Israel, yes. He gave the law to Moses. But the whole point of the law, and we read all of this in the New Testament, the New Testament shines a big old spotlight on the Old Testament and just reveals so much of the truth that, is, that is, has been in the Old Testament the whole time. But it just really makes it much more clear for us to understand today. But all throughout history, people have been saved by faith. Saved by grace through faith. It's the grace of God is the only way that anyone has ever been saved all throughout mankind's history. The law is there as a schoolmaster to teach us that we're sinners. To teach us that we're not perfect. To teach us that we are not righteous. Because none of us keep the law. None of the, the, the Jews in the Old Testament didn't keep God's law. Nobody has ever been able to keep God's law except for one man, the man Jesus Christ. The only person ever to keep the law perfectly was Jesus Christ. And other than that, everybody has fallen short for, fallen short for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. So what I, what I really love about these verses is look at verse 4 there. It says, look, this is talking about the people that came out with Moses, that came out of Egypt. It says they were all baptized. It says that they all drank the same spiritual drink and they all drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. It says, and that rock was Christ. They had Christ in the Old Testament. Why? Because Jesus Christ is a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. God, know, God knew everything before he even created everything. And it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around this. And this, this kind of leads to a lot of false doctrine of Calvinism and other things. And people say, well, if God knew this was going to happen, then, then why did he even bother creating us? And I was like, you really want to question all of the motivations of God, you're going to find yourself not fully understanding everything. Because we, don't, we do not grasp everything that God does and why. He doesn't tell us, if he doesn't tell us why he doesn't know, the Bible does tell us that we are and were created for his pleasure. So the answer to that is just, well, it's for his pleasure. Okay, What's his pleasure? Is he, is he pleased with people going to hell? No, he's not pleased with him. But he's definitely pleased with people... Believing on Christ and getting saved and serving Him and doing things for Him and loving Him out of our own free will. And see, ultimately, anyone who has, who has a question about that, and I don't want to get too far off on this rabbit trail. i got a lot to teach tonight. But people have a problem with the fact that God foreknew everything and then question, well, why would He even do it? If He knew that there was going to be cancer and all these horrible things and children dying and stuff, then why would He even create it in the first place? But you see, God didn't cause those things to happen. He gave us the free will and, and, and the beauty of having that will, the, the, the ability to choose for ourselves what we're going to do. All the bad things come as a result of men doing bad things, not God doing bad things. But what, the reason what we're created for was His pleasure and he, the pleasure that He gets more than anything, and, and you should know this to be true, if you created a robot and programmed it to just always tell you, I love you. I love you. 
is that really going to satisfy you? Is it going to make you feel just really warm inside knowing that your robot loves you because you programmed it to say, I love you over and over and over again. That's, that's, there's no choice going on there. It's just a machine repeating some words. Is that really fulfilling at all? Of course not. So God did not create us as robots to just do everything that he says to do. He gave us the option to choose. Now, it's a whole other thing when you have a person that's got the choice to actually love another person. And when a human being tells you, I love you, that means a lot because they don't have to. You have the choice. And when, when God receives our love and our praise and we sing praises unto him and we do things for him, hey, that's pleasing unto God. And that's why he created us. It's not because he wants all this evil. He doesn't want anybody. The Bible says the Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants us all to get saved. He wants us all to be believers, and he wants us all to serve him, but he leaves that up to you. But the, the praise is perfected in, in just in the sense that it's coming from our own hearts. And that's why, the reason why I think he even gave it to us to begin with, because that's what actually ultimately gives him pleasure. Not the fact that he just was able to make something to do that, but left it up to us to decide to do that. Um, but that is a whole nother rabbit trail that I wasn't even planning on getting into tonight. But um, what's amazing here is we see that, that Christ is back in the Old Testament here. Now, when Israel was delivered out of Egypt and passed over the Red Sea, you remember Moses parted the waters of the Red Sea, the Egyptians were coming, they were chasing them, and they walked through the Red Sea as if on dry ground, and the water came up on both sides of them. So what this is, it's not a literal baptism, but it's a picture of baptism because they were basically immersed in water. They had water all over them and they came through and came up and that was after their salvation that God wrought in Egypt. So they got saved by, by God delivering them out of Egypt and then they get baptized through their you know, coming, going through the Red Sea and then ultimately they're just done with Egypt. From that point forward it's just they are done with the world and they're, and they're you know, the world of Egypt and they're moving on to the promised land. And, um, you know, it's a picture of our own salvation. When we get saved, we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, that's the deliverance from Egypt. But then the, the baptism kind of seals that. And, and the whole picture, and I'm not going to get into all of the symbolism just in baptism itself, but really what you're doing is you're dying to self, you're burying that old man, and you're starting afresh, and you're living this new life, and you're saying, you know what, I'm going to live for God now. I'm going to walk as, as, a, as a new creature in, in Christ. And that's the, the symbolism that's going forward after you get baptized. And I know this is as true as a day is long for me, I got saved when I was 20 years old, but I, it took me about seven years before I got baptized. And for all that time in between, I didn't really live for God at all. I didn't really leave the world behind. Now, I was saved. I was born again because all you have to do to be saved is put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I did that. I was born again. I was a child of God. But I didn't see much more of the, of the changing and the desire to serve God and everything until after I got baptized. When I took that step, it's like I finally decided, you know what? I'm just going to put the world behind me, boom, get baptized, now I'm going to live for God. And I know that's the way for many, many, many people, that once you do that, especially those that kind of wait a little bit before they end up getting baptized, and that's why I don't recommend waiting. I think we ought, you know, once you get saved, you know you're saved, your faith is in Christ, hey, get baptized right away and use that as your moment to start living for Christ right away. So what we see here is that this was all a picture. All this, and he's going in. We're going to see as we get further into this chapter, he brings up a lot of aspects that were going on in the Old Testament when the children of Israel were brought out. And you know, people can look and be like, why, do I read the, well, why don't we just read the New Testament? I mean, we're living in the New Testament days. Jesus Christ has already risen from the dead. Why do we even bother with the Old Testament? I mean, the Old Testament could be boring. right? Who wants to read the Old Testament? And there's all these negativity and all this other stuff. Well, look. First of all, the Bible says that, that all Scripture, all Scripture is profitable for doctrine. All Scripture is given by God and is profitable for doctrine and for instruction in righteousness. and righteousness. And it's important to read. But what we're seeing here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, look at verse number, uh, 
11, because we're going we're gonna to go through all of these other things individually, these other verses. Verse 11 says, Now all these things happened unto them for in samples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. The reason why God even recorded these stories about the children of Israel and, uh, and all their traveling through the wilderness of sin and you know, going into the promised land, they say, why do we care about all this stuff? Yeah, it pertained to them back then, but why does it matter to us? Because they're examples. There's many, many, many examples that we can learn from the Bible. And the best way to learn about something or, or to live righteously for God is to not have to learn for yourself the hard way. You do not want to learn these truths the hard way. If you can learn them, learn from the mistakes of others is way better than making the mistake yourself. Anybody who's been there knows that. I know that for a fact in many areas of my own life. If I could have just listened to the Bible, if I could have just listened to what was right and just accepted it and had the faith to believe it, instead of having to prove it for myself, man, there's a lot of things that would have gone a lot better. And... That's basically what he's saying here. Now, we're going to go through each individual. We're going to spend a little bit of time and go back to all of these events in the Old Testament that is being referred to here because we want to use these examples and really try to learn as much as possible from them so that we can avoid these pitfalls in our life. And we're going to get a much deeper understanding. So let's see here what he says in verse number five. It says, but with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. So he starts off saying, look, they all drank of that spiritual drink, the, you know, the, the rock, Jesus Christ. They all came out, they were all baptized. And the point he's making, it's not that every single person was a believer that came out of there. But what he's referring to here is people who were saved and then getting into sin and how God deals with them. We're going to see many sins here, and a lot of these are very grievous sins. They're serious sins to be committed. And God will punish His children. And you can believe that. We need to remember that. Now, we teach and believe wholeheartedly that salvation is completely free, and it's grace, and all you have to do is believe. And it's really simple to be forgiven of all of your sins and to avoid hell and go to heaven because your faith is in Christ. But we can't just take that to this next level of just saying, well, it doesn't really matter if we sin. Because it does matter if we sin. That would be a foolish thing to just think that, well, I could just do whatever I want because I'm saved. And a lot of times people have a hard time even accepting salvation because they have this type of mindset of just automatically assuming that, well, what you're saying is I could just go off and sin and it's okay. And I always correct people at the door. I'm not saying it's okay because it's not okay. Now, I am saying that God will not send you to hell for all of those sins if your faith is in Christ. He has removed that punishment. He has atoned and paid for those sins for the eternal sense of paying for them in hell. He has done that. But once you're a believer, you're a child of God and God will discipline you in many ways as his child when you start getting into these sins. So we're going to look into this. And that's why he says, look, all of these things that, that we're reading in the Old Testament, they're examples. They're given to you for an example. Verse number five. So. The, you know, they, they were saved, but he said, with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples, verse number six, to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Why? Because it's totally possible. You know, there's some people that think, oh, well, if you're saved, you won't do those things. And they say, oh, you judge people at work. You won't do those things if you're truly saved. And people want to question your salvation and doubt yourself, make you doubt your own salvation. Well, you would never commit fornication if you were saved. You would never drink alcohol if you were saved. You know, people say these things. Don't buy into that nonsense. If that were true, then why would we even be reading these words and these verses that we're reading right now saying, hey, look, they drank that same spiritual drink. They had Christ they did these things, and now I'm telling you, O oh church at Corinth, who is a church of believers in Christ, not to do these things, that we need to watch out for these things. So yes, it absolutely is possible. We still have this flesh that will drive us to sin and to lust and to temptation. 
So let's look at verse number 7. It says, Neither be ye idolaters as some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Now, keep your finger here in 1 Corinthians 10. We're going to go to Exodus. Exodus chapter 32. We're going to see his reference to idolatry. Because he's warning us. Don't you be idolaters as they were. Well, how were they idolaters? Let's look at it. Exodus chapter number 22. And I've mentioned this many times, and I'll keep bringing it up till I'm blue in the face. When you, when you want to study the Bible, when you're reading the Bible, and you see references to the Old Testament, if you want to understand what the New Testament is teaching even more, go back to all of those references that are being brought up and read them. And get that in context with the New Testament, and, you're, and you'll gain much better understanding. Because if they're referencing it, it's being assumed that you know what they're talking about. But it's always good to go back and just reread the stories. I mean, I was able to, I knew, every single one while I was reading this, I knew what, which situation he was talking about with the children of Israel. I knew what, what, you know, which portion of the Bible he was talking about. But it's always good to go back and read it. Because just because you know, yeah, like I remember when that happened. I remember when the children of Israel were lusting and, and God killed 23,000 of them or whatever. But when you go back now and reread it, now we're going to get a little bit more uh, clarity in our minds about what was going on. Now, idolatry, it's not like it's a, it's a very complicated sin, but um, many things can be considered idolatry these days. But let's look here. I've got at verse number 1 of Exodus chapter 32. I'm sorry, did I say 22? I meant 32. I apologize. I'm in Exodus 22. You said both. I said both? I thought 32. Yeah. I must have changed it. Exodus 32 is where I want you to be. Exodus 32, chapter 1. Verse 1. It's chapter 1. Now, now I'm really going really to confuse you. Watch out. <laughs> Exodus chapter 32, verse number 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Make a, up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we what not what has become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in, your, in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand, and fashioned it with a graving tool, after he had made it a, a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made excuse me, proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they, set, and they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And look at this. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. And this is the same reference that we saw in verse number 7 of verse Corinthians 10. It says, Neither be ye idolaters as some of them, as is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So this is the exact reference that he's talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It's, if, you, if you're familiar with the story, Moses went up into the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments of the Lord. And he went up there. And he was up there for a long He was up there for 40 days and 40 nights. So he's up there for a really long time. You say, how is that possible? He didn't eat or drink. Yeah, God sustained him. He was, he was literally like, like communicating with God like face to face. And um, he was up, but he was gone for a long time. I mean, think about that. That's over a month. So Moses is the one that led them out of Egypt. Now here they are. And, and now remember too, though, this is the people that saw all those plagues, all those miracles, everything else that was going on. They're waiting around. Okay, a month has gone by. They're like, the guy's probably dead. You know, who knows what happened to Moses? Who knows what happened to that guy? They're like, whatever. We're sick of waiting for him. And they get antsy and they, say, and they, they, they bring Aaron under and say, Aaron, you've got to make us gods. So he listens to them and they start worshiping. You know, they, they, they put this gold into a fire and then all of a sudden this thing comes out and they're like, oh, it looks like a calf. Right? So like, oh, here's your gods. And it's silly. It's ridiculous. I mean, it's hard to even think of, of people even doing this, but this is what they did. 
And people do the same thing today. As hard as it might be to believe, there's, there's people that put up their, their trinkets and their statues. You know, we walk, uh, it, it's a lot more common in Phoenix. There's some areas of Phoenix, especially in a lot of the Hispanic communities that are, that, that are um, Catholic. And they have their graven image of Mary out in the front yard. And they've got all their other images and statues and things that they put up there. And they literally will, will bow down, especially inside the Catholic Church. They'll bow down and they'll pray to these, now, the Bible says, when the Bible talks about worshiping, worshiping is bowing down before something. That is, that's what the word worship means. You know, it's kind of confused today. People think of worship as like worship songs and singing praises. That's not worship. Worship is when you get down on your, on your knees. That's worshiping. And I've done a whole sermon where, I, where, I've, where I've proved that. Actually, I think it was the one on the Ten Commandments about, about idolatry and not having any other gods before, before him. But, um, so we see here, the children of Israel, they, they, they get, don't want to wait for Moses. They don't want to wait on God. And there's, a le there's many lessons to be learned here. Just remember this. We don't always have things happen to us in, in our time. They have to happen in God's time. And when so many people make the mistake is when you jump the gun and you say, well, I've been praying and going to church and things just aren't right yet, so I need to take matters in my own hands and I'm just going to go and do this. Or I'm just going to go, maybe this isn't the right place for me to go. I'm just going to go to this other church. I'm just going to go follow this other religion or whatever because they just expect things to happen in the, just in their own mind. And they're not waiting on God. Now, Moses was the right man to be following. Guess what? He was the one talking to God. But for whatever reason, they were thinking, and this was kind of indicative of the, of the children of Israel going through. There's a lot of people, they were murmuring and complaining, and we'll get to that a little bit later, but, you know, about the food and not having water. Say, oh, you delivered us out of Egypt, now to kill us here in the desert, what are you doing? You know, and just always doubting and, and, and just expecting something different than what God was giving them. And getting angry about it and, and end up getting into all kinds of sin. So the first lesson I think we can learn is, is we need to make sure that we stay on God's time and understand that things aren't always going to work out the way that we might envision them in our head. Or when we pray for people or when bad things happen to us, don't always think that when bad things happen, it's a result of your immediate actions or things that you might have just done. Or think, you know, Some people will get discouraged from going soul winning. Maybe the very first time they go out and try to give the gospel to someone, you know, someone slams the door in their face. Or someone yells at them or something. And, oh, well, I guess that's a sign I shouldn't be doing this. No, don't let those types of factors influence you. Well, I've been praying to God and He hasn't been answering me. So I must not be doing it right. I'm going to go and find some other God or some other way to pray or something like that. We need to make sure that we do things the right way and just stick with it and stay the course. Because we need to be on God's time here. So this is what the people did. They, they had them just create their gods because we don't, know, we don't know what this Moses is doing. And what they did is says they sat down to eat and to drink and they rose up to play. Now it says they rose up to play. I mean, it's not talking about softball. Okay. The Bible is very careful with its words and it's, and it's not ever dirty or, or uses you know, too much explicit language. Every, you know, every word of God is pure and is righteous. So when it says that they rose up to play, they were doing things they definitely shouldn't have been doing because we'll see here later that uh, Aaron had made them naked. So they were playing around and, be, and being nude while doing so. As they were throwing, basically they were throwing this big party and getting into all kinds of sin that they shouldn't have been getting into. Verse seven, let's jump down to verse 17 here. We're going to see a little bit now about uh, Moses coming down. It says, And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, There's a noise of war in the camp. So they're coming back down from the mountain, and, and Joshua's with Moses. And he's saying, that sound, There sounds like there's a, war, there's a battle going on. Because they, they just hear all the screaming and whatever, whatever else is going on down there. Joshua's just thinking it's a war. Verse 18, And he said, Moses responded to him, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands and brake them beneath the mount. And he took the calf, 
which they had made and burnt it in the fire and ground it to powder and strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. And Moses said unto Aaron, Why did this peop What did this people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? And Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people that they are set of mischief. For they said unto me, Make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let him break it off. So they gave it me. Then I cast it into fire, and there came out this calf. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. Very serious repercussions for this sin. And this is one of the reasons why it's being brought up again. He's saying, hey, look, don't get into that idolatry. There's a very, very serious punishment for that. And that's you know, what he's trying to explain here. One of the things that we can learn from this is that you can sin, and it can be bad enough where God can just end your life, and God will just take your life from you. He's saying, look, they all were baptized. They all had that same spiritual rock. But look at what happened when they got into idolatry. They got into all kinds of sin. As we saw there in that verse, they were naked. They were, they were, they were partying. I picture it's probably like this big Woodstock event, right? I mean, there's people getting naked. They're dancing around. They're playing this music. And Moses comes down. He sees it. And he doesn't take it for one second. Moses sets things right. He's like, he takes that, he takes that calf, grinds it up into powder, burns it, grinds up into powder. He said, here, you're going to drink this. I think I like with, with kids, you know, they say a dirty word or something, a parent goes, puts a, a bar of soap in their mouth. They're going to clean out your mouth. He made them drink that ground up idol and say, here's your idol. You're going to drink it. And, and not only that, though, it was, it was even more serious than that, obviously, because he said, okay, who's on God's side here? And what Moses executed here was a righteous judgment. The Levites stood up and said, we're worth God. And they executed the job. Is that a fun thing to do? No. It's a very sad thing. It's a grievous thing. But it's something that needed to be done um, because God was angry with them. That was, that was a, that's a serious... Of all the sins in the Bible, putting another God before, before God is like probably the worst one. And you think about even in Romans 1, when people are given over to a reprobate mind, why is that? It's because they worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. It's because they've rejected God and decided to set up their own God. And all throughout the Bible, why does he bring judgment against the people of Israel? Because they've rejected God and they've gone and worshipped other gods. Every time, I mean, they could be involved in all kinds of other sins, but as soon as they get involved in idolatry, as soon as they get involved in worshipping another god, that's when the judgment comes. That's when God removes them from the land and says, I've had enough of you. That's the moment when he's just like, I'm done. Because our God's a jealous God. Now let's look at, uh, turn if you would to Numbers chapter 25. We're going to look at the next sin that's mentioned in 1 Corinthians 10. Turn over to Numbers 25. I'll read from you the next verse, verse 8 from 1 Corinthians 10. So he said, Neither be idolaters as some of them were, as is written. The people sat, uh, sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We see the very seriousness of that sin and what they did, not waiting on God and getting involved in, in all kinds of other sin as a result and had serious consequence. As we're, All of these have serious consequences. We're going to see in every single one of these death being a consequence of their sin. The Bible says for the wages of sin is death. Sometimes it's a very literal death. Physical. It's always literal. Verse number 8 says, Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Numbers. Numbers chapter 25. Eight. Numbers chapter 25 is, is going to be the story we find. It's, the, it's the, the issue of Baal Peor. 
is when the children of Israel got really caught up in fornication. And it says here, and fell in one day, three and tw 23, think about 23,000 people dying in one day. That's a lot of people. That's like half of Prescott Valley. Just imagine just half of the people in town here all being dead. Half of the houses being empty. That's serious. We, we, ought, we ought to take heed. Let's see, let's see what happened here in Numbers chapter 25. We're going to look at verse number 1. Numbers 25, verse 1. And Israel abode in Shittim. And the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods. And the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. So there's also idolatry mixed up in this too. And notice the connection between the two. We're always going to find that connection throughout the Bible, even with King Solomon, when you know, God had commanded them not to go unto strange women, to, to the women of these other nations where they served other gods, because the women were going to turn their hearts away from serving the Lord. And here we see them committing whoredom, so not even just getting married unto them, but even worse than that, just going and fornicating with these other women, and now they start um, you know, offering sacrifices unto these other gods, and the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. So they're worshiping these other gods also. It says in verse 3, And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Look at this, Slay ye every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses. This is how brazen they had gotten in their sin. They know, they already know better they're not supposed to be committing whoredom. They know they're not supposed to be fornicating, especially with the people of the, other la of the, of the heathen land. They go to Baal Peor, and there's, you know, there's these heathen women there, and they start committing fornication. It says here, one of the children of Israel brought unto his brethren a Midianite woman in the sight of... So Moses is right there, and he doesn't even care. I mean, Moses is leading the people, and he's already gone through all this other stuff, and he's just like, just so brazen with his actions to just walk, waltz right out with his, with his heathen girlfriend... In the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand, and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel, and those that died in the plague were twenty and four thousand. Now, a few things I want to mention here. First of all, you say, wait a minute, I thought 1 Corinthians 10 said 23,000. It does. 1 Corinthians 10 says 23,000, but then why does this say, and those that died in the plague were twenty and four thousand? And people will be quick to jump, oh, there's a contradiction in the Bible, oh, there's an error, they made a mistake, it's wrong. No, 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 no. And you know what? Sometimes people will try to bring these things up to you. Don't let it shake your faith. Don't let it shake your faith. Here's why. Because when you read it carefully and look at it, you sometimes you have to look at it multiple times, you'll see, oh, it's not a mistake. It actually says, like in this example, in 1 Corinthians 10, there fell in one day 23,000 people. In Numbers 25, 9, it says, and those that died in the plague were 24,000 people. So in one day, 23,000 people died, but 24,000 people died altogether from that one plague from the Lord. So an extra thousand people died, just not all on that same day. They just died a little bit later. It just took a little bit more time, another day or two or however long. It doesn't say. But real simple explanation. It's not a contradiction. You just have to be looking at it closely to see, oh, okay, that's why. But we see here again, what was the judgment? Phineas came in with a javelin and, and killed him. Now... <coughs> 
I'm not expecting anybody here to pick up a sword or to pick up a gun and to go and start killing people that are in sin. Okay, these are things that we can learn from. But what we do, what we can learn from this, because it's not our job to, to take justice on other people. There is a government that's instituted for that reason to execute judgment on people who, who commit crimes that are worthy of punishment. And, that's, and that is the authority to execute that judgment is given unto uh, the government. But what we can learn from this is look at the, the zeal and the hatred for sin and the wanting to serve God so much that, that he was willing to go and do that. And God recognizes this and this is actually, God blesses Phineas for doing this, for, for having that zeal to serve God and to, and to stop the wickedness and the unrighteousness. And we have way too many Christians with no backbone, with no spine to be able to stand up so that when, when wickedness is abounding, too many people are just silent and they tolerate it, and they put up with it, and then it just gets worse and worse and worse because people are going to keep pushing the envelope, especially the wicked people are going to keep pushing the envelope to see how far they could go before people are going to say, you know what, I've had it with this. It's to the point now, I went to, to, a, to a gas station, there is a guy working behind the desk, a, a man, and he had blue makeup on his eyes. And somehow that's just completely normal now in today's society and no one says anything. That a guy could just go around wearing makeup and I guess we'll just be okay with that. I don't know about you, but if my kids were in there, I, would, <laughs> I definitely would have been like rebuking it for being wrong because the, you know, no kids ought to be seeing that and thinking that's normal or acceptable. And we can't be tolerating this type of sin in our society. And, and you know, especially, I mean, he was so brazen. It's like, it's like coming to church just, just in open fornication, just in open rebellion to God. We're not going to stand for it. And even, even the churches these days, there's too many of them that are just, anything goes, so we just need to love everybody. Now look, I'm all for loving people, but one of the ways you love them is, is correcting them. And not just tolerating any, just having an anything goes type of attitude or atmosphere. That's not the way it is here. Twenty-four thousand people died as a result of that sin for fornication. Let's look at the next, the next sin, verse number nine. And for you could turn if you would to Numbers twenty-one. Just, just flip uh, back a, a few, a few pages there. To Numbers 21. I'll read from you the next verse in 1 Corinthians 10 that we're reading here. So first he said, neither be idolaters. Then in the next verse he said, neither let us commit fornication. In verse 9, neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Again, another reference to Christ. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also did. In the Old Testament. So Christ wasn't even born yet. How could they tempt Christ? Because Christ is God in the flesh. The Bible says there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Christ was around in the Old Testament. Christ existed. Christ is from everlasting. Christ does not have a, a origin. As the New Versions will say that, that he's from ancient times and that there's an origin. And watch out for that. That's why I preach. That's why we're King James only, by the way. I don't have the reference at the top of my head, but there are many of the new versions that will say that Christ had an origin, a beginning. Again, it's just, it's, it's wicked. It's evil. So your numbers 21. Let's start reading here in verse number 2. And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, if thou wilt indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. And he called the name of the place Hormah. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. 
And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. And the light bread they're referring to is the manna that God miraculously provided for them to have food. And now they're saying, well, we're getting sick of this manna. I know that it's a miracle from God and that God has actually given us our sustenance, but we're sick of it. I'm sick of what God's doing for me. I want more. And notice here, too, in, at the end of verse 4, it says, The soul of the people were much discouraged because of the way. It started to get a little bit difficult. The way, the path that they were walking on. Now, it's easy, and, and try not to get too caught up. It's easy for us, the reader, to say, Oh, boo-hoo, poor Israel, right? Toughen up. Do it right. It's easy to say that. But put yourself in their shoes just, just briefly what they were going through because that is what's key to understanding how we need to be in our life. It's really easy when things are going good to be saying, you should be doing this and you should be doing that. But think about what they were actually doing walking on foot and traveling for great distances and not eating very much and not drinking very much. And that's why he said, look, Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water in our soul. Oh, this is like bread. So think about if all you had was, you know, and the manna was described as being kind of like a bread, like a real light bread. And that's all you ate every day. And just, I mean, day after day after day for years. You're just eating the same thing. It's not this big filling meal. You're eating just enough is what you need. You're going, you're, you're traveling, you're walking, you're going through the, you know, you're, you're going on these long journeys. You don't have a, like a home really. I mean, you've got your, your tent or whatever they were, they were dwelling in. They got a dwelling place, but not really a home. It's not the easiest of lives. So we just, just keep that in mind, right? Keep, as, as you compare your life to theirs, and when you consider the difficult, the, the, the honest difficulties that they had to put up with, but when we read it in light of the Bible, the way that God views it, He doesn't accept the murmuring and complaining. God doesn't want you complaining about where you're at in your life. He wants you to be content. Even if you're just getting very little food for your sustenance, but you're being sustained. You're being maintained. Jesus didn't have a home. He didn't have a place to lay His head. He went through it. He got through it. And we can too. And see, we need to get to the point that, you know, as Apostle Paul said, you know, whether I abase, I'm a base or whether I abound in all things, I know, you know, he knows how to, how to deal with it. He knows how to, to be content with the things that he has, to be satisfied and just say, well, whether I have a very little or whether I have a lot, I'm going to be okay with it. I'm not gonna, when I get a lot, I'm not going to be greedy and just want more and more and more. And when I have a little, I'm going to say, you know what? This is what God's given me, and I'm okay with it. I'm going to be satisfied with it. I'm not going to complain about it. And when they questioned Moses, they questioned God. It says they spake against God. They spake against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no bread here. There's no water here. You are so low that this light bread, verse 6, and the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. So this is the, the again, God got frustrated with all their complaining and with their tempting God. Now what does a tempt mean? They're testing God. Why did you bring us out here? We can't survive out here. God has already provided for them, and now they're saying, there's no water here, there's no food here, and you're not able to provide for us. Tempting God, like as if God is not able to do that. And it got God angry, and that's where he sent the serpents, and they went through the camp, and they bit people, and a lot of people died. Turn, if you would, back a few more chapters of chapter 14, Numbers 14. Because this is tied in with what we just read there about murmuring. 
So in 1 Corinthians 10, they said, it said in verse 9, Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. So here we just read that passage where they were destroyed of serpents, where the snakes came in and they bit them and they died. And it's because of their complaining, but not just their complaining, because they were tempting God and saying, oh, you brought us out in this wilderness here to die. And they questioned God's word there and they tempted, they tempted Christ. Verse number 10 in 1 Corinthians says, Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. So you're in Numbers 14, look at verse 26. <coughs> And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel which they murmur against me. Say unto them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me, Doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. But your little ones, which ye said should be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness, and your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of the days in which ye searched the land, even forty days each day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquities, even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. I, the Lord, have said, I will surely do it unto all this evil congregation that are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall be consumed, and there they shall die." And the men which Moses sent to search the land who returned and made all the congregation to murmur against him by bringing up a slander upon the land, even those men that did bring up the evil report upon the land died by the plague before the Lord. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of the men that went to search the land, lived still. So murmuring against God, they were destroyed of the destroyer because they ultimately were not allowed to even go into the promised land. Then they said, you know what? You're just going to wander in this wilderness and you're going to die out here. Why? Because they didn't trust God because when they went out to spy out the promised land, they said, there's giants in the land. It's a great land, but we can't do it. They're going to kill us. They're going to slaughter us. Why did you even bring us out here? There's no way that we could take this land. And then they murmured and they wanted to go back into Egypt. And it made God angry. They were complaining. They were murmuring. And they were complaining after what a great, it was a land that flows with milk and honey. The Bible says there's this great land. They brought back the fruit of the land and all the, these, these grapes. And, you know, they, they were so amazing and full of fruit and just, and just a, a beautiful land. Instead of saying, Wow, what a great land that God's promised. Hey, hey, if he promised it to us, let's just go and take it because it's God gave it to us and we're finally here. They said, we can't do it. And they started complaining about it. Be why? Because it looked too difficult. Don't question God, especially when things become difficult in your life. And that's kind of a common theme between all of these things. They questioned God. They questioned where was Moses. They got into idolatry, right? They, they, they got into the fornication at Baal Peor. And again, were steered away from serving God. They tempted Christ. And now they're murmuring and, and they're complaining about God. And it's leading, it's just bringing death upon death upon death upon all these people. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I just wanted to go through all these examples because there's a lot of similarities between them. And to get a, a, a real proper understanding and looking at the mistakes that they made, that the children of Israel made coming out of the land of Egypt and using them for our ensamples. Using them as an example of something that we shouldn't be doing and that we shouldn't let ourselves get into. Now, you may not find yourself wandering through a wilderness, as they did, but apply it to your life. Apply it to the, to the you know, 
You might feel like you're wandering through a wilderness because of the way things are going in your life. Maybe, maybe your finances are having, are having a hard time and it's, and it's real rough. We need to make sure that we're not faulting God, that we're still trusting in God, not losing our faith, not complaining. Because for all the things that we can complain about what we don't have, instead of complaining about it, we need to recognize what do we have. And that is the mindset that God wants us to have. The murmuring is what he gets upset about. And it's really humbling, you know, it can be really humbling when you see someone who has this mindset, who has almost nothing, but they're still happy. And they say, you know what? God's good to me. I have, I have this cardboard box to keep me sheltered from the storm. Right? I mean, think about if that's all you had. It was a place to just, just some box on the street. And there's people like that. But you are thankful for that. We need to count our blessings and make sure that, that we don't get caught up with this wrong attitude of focusing on what we don't have and focus on what we do have. Now, I know there's, there's legitimate situations and we, we, we have stress and we have concerns and, and, and we have bills to be paid and, and all these other things that need to be taken care of and they're real problems and I understand that. But as we deal with those problems in our life and we're looking for the answers, just make sure that you don't get a, a bitter, complaining, murmuring type of an attitude. Let's keep reading here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse number 11, uh, we'll reiterate this. Now all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. They're written for us, for our examples. Verse 12, Wherefore, so for this reason, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. And this is, this is what I was saying. It's easy to look upon the children of Israel and, oh man, if I was around during that time, I wouldn't have gotten involved in all that stuff and I would have been serving God. You know, hey, you think you stand, take heed lest you fall. We need to make sure that we're not just above all of these sins. We need to keep on guard and, and always be protecting ourselves against these and be aware of these sins so that we're not just going to think that we're so safe and we're just, you know, I would never, I would never commit fornication. I would never commit adultery. I would, it would never happen. Now, I won't ever do it, but I'm not going to get to the point to where I'm just thinking I'm so far above and beyond that temptation that all of a sudden I'm not paying attention and being on guard against that and start allowing myself to get into way too many situations because I'm just saying, oh, I would never do that. Well, because I would never do that, now it's okay for me to go and whatever. You know, I, I don't even want to get, in, get into all the different things, but we needed to, to take heed to ourselves lest we fall. Verse number 13, There hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. And this is encouraging. The temptations that we receive, they're common. Okay, Every, everyone goes through these things. They're different. A lot of people go through the same exact type of temptations. It's common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. God will never allow you to go through something that is too much for you to handle. Praise the Lord for that. And we may go through a lot of things where you might feel like, God, I can't go through anymore. <coughs> but he always makes a way to escape so that it's never quite too much for you. And that is, and that is something that we could, especially in your, in your hardest times, keep this verse at heart. And remember that. It'll give you a little bit more strength to keep going through. As difficult as, th as things can be, God won't allow you to go through more than you can handle. I know we've been through some tough times in my family where you, know, where you just think, like, I can't take anymore. But God will make sure that you can.
All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up here. There's a, lot, there's a lot more that I have in my notes that we could go over in this chapter. There's a really long chapter. There's a lot of things in here that we could learn from. But as I mentioned before, I already preached on, I just want to bring up this as we close because tonight we're going to be participating in the communion of Jesus Christ, of his body and of his blood. So we're going to keep reading here in uh, verse number 14. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. So here, we, I preached on Sunday morning about the Lord's Supper and, and how we do things here. And that's in chapter 11. He goes into a lot of detail about that. It's all, so we call it, typically in, in the church here, we call it the Lord's Supper. We also call it communion. And we see here, you know, the cup of blessing, which we bless, is not the communion of the blood of Christ. We're partaking of Christ's uh, flesh, of his body, and of his blood when we participate in the Lord's Supper. So that's why we could also call it communion. You could hear it referred to both ways. Because we're communing, communing with Jesus Christ. We're becoming a partaker with Jesus Christ symbolically. And that's where this, the rest of this chapter, for the most part, is going to go into eating things offered unto idols. And, and he's saying, look, you can't be partaking with the table, you know, sit at the table of devils and then sit at the table of Christ. You know, we need to make sure that we're keeping ourselves pure with Christ, especially when we do communion. Okay, and that's why when we do communion here, we, you know, and, and you know what, I'll get into that real quick. Let's just, let's close uh, in a, with a word of prayer. Let's for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for um, this opportunity to preach tonight. I pray that you would please help us all to, to grow some more and that the scripture would sink down deep into our heart and that we could keep these encouraging words that, uh, that, that you won't let us go through more than we're able to handle, dear God. And I pray that you please help us have our hearts right with you, that we could be content with the things that we have, dear Lord, and that we would take heed to ourselves that we don't fall into any of these grievous sins that the children of Israel fell into, dear Lord, and that we can look at the examples that, that are written for us in the Bible and that we can learn from them so that we don't make the same mistakes, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to be wise and help us to remain humble and not lifted up with pride, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.